we're going to go over a lot of scripture. So in a way, if you, if you don't feel like you've been in a Bible study yet, you're going to feel that way. And I want you to feel that way. And I want you to delight in that. I want you to take pleasure in that. Because the Bible is beautiful. And it's delightful. And it should give you pleasure. And it should encourage you and get you excited. And it should embolden you. And you should feel strength come out of it. You know, in a lot of ways, the, the Bible is the gift of the Jews, isn't it? It's all Hebrew scripture. It's quite amazing. And I read uh, this book recently by Thomas Cahill, and I recommend it to you. He's the one who wrote um, maybe a little bit better well-known book, How the Irish Saved Civilization. <laughs> Why is that funny? Amen. <laughs> Any Irish in here? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, first I read that, and that's profound, but then I found all his other books, you know, and I have a copy of it right over here. So in, in The Gift of the Jews, Thomas Cahill argues that the Old Testament especially represents the first ever literature of its kind. Is he talking about Hebrew literature or Middle Eastern literature? No. He's talking about historical narrative. That before Hebrew literature began to be written, historical narrative did not exist. He lays this out first by examining in very close detail the literature of the Sumerians. Now, I didn't say Sumerians. Like... Samaritans, okay? Sumerians were Mesopotamians. They were the people that inhabited the, the, the area and what was once an empire in Iraq, what is now Iraq. And if you've heard of Gilgamesh, there's the Gilgamesh epic and other uh, legends and myths surrounding that, which is probably the best well-known piece of Sumerian literature, um, then at least you know a bit of it. Sumerian literature, you know, had lots and lots of poetry and lots of, lot, lots of sayings and sort of proverbs and epic battles without any, you know, geographical details to root them in reality. And, um, you know, we, we know that it was mythology, and even um, those who ascribe to it know that it was mythology. And, and the same is true of Greek writing. You know, Greeks know that all the Greek gods were mythological, okay? But not so with the Hebrew Scriptures. The Hebrew Scriptures are... are just so entirely different because they are rooted in history. That's why they call it historical narrative. The Old Testament forms a timeline, you know, of several thousand years and even more if you go back to the to the beginning of what's recorded in the in, in the first chapter of Genesis. Creates a, a chronology from beginning to end. And the Old Testament more or less follows this chronology. And history matters. And real events matter. And the causes and effects of those real events matter in the Old Testament. So this is a whole new genre and a whole new world view to go with that. Because the Sumerians were pagans. And guess what? The whole rest of the world were pagans. Pagans had um, a number of things in, in common. They believed in, in, in the wheel of fortune. They believed in the wheel of fortune. That means that life and all of reality is a wheel. It just goes round and round and round. It doesn't matter when things begin and, and when things end. It's a circular, you know, should I start singing, 
the circle of life. You know, Elton John's uh, famous song from The Lion King. Well, he was singing about the, the Wheel of Fortune because uh, that was a, a prevalent African worldview as well. Okay? Um, the decisions you make don't matter very much. All that matters is that you appease the gods, that you, that you, that you um, satisfy them long enough to keep them out of your business or to give you rain and, and, and fertility, and all these things. Look at, look at this outline in which I give you three theses. We're going to go to thesis two, and I'm going to ask you to imagine a machine, a machine that has all kinds of working parts, you know, a complex machine, um, all, all kinds of different machines that have thousands of functioning working parts and that produce something they, or they do some kind of work and they make things easier for us. That's one of the things that uh, characterizes human beings is, is that we can make machines. That's, that's awesome. And we can use them. You know, animals can't do that. But also imagine a symphony orchestra, which is like a machine too. Um, each of the players in a symphony orchestra has a different instrument or a different kind of instrument. And, you know, they could all play in a cacophony. You know, if everyone played their own thing, their own piece, or their own, you know, just sound, it would be just noise, right? Meaningless noise with no pattern and no rhythm at all. Okay, but a symphony orchestra is not like that. It's better than that. It has organization and so on. And, and I'll make reference to that too. So let me read Thesis 2 here. The Bible is a matchless library of Hebrew books with great diversity. Like in the varied instruments in a symphony orchestra or a machine with multiple parts. And yet it has a grand meta-narrative. Replete with interconnected themes and motifs. In literature, a meta-narrative is an overarching storyline with a master plot that controls all the subplots, as with those in a sophisticated novel, and even more so with a novel series, such as The Lord of the Rings. Despite their diversity, both the symphony and the complex machine function because they have a master purpose and plan. Together with a master design and organization, all these elements require a master designer. The elements do not occur by accident. In terms of the symphony, it's the work of the composer and the conductor to bring the various players of the instruments into unity and harmony. In terms of the complex machine, pull up that back again, that imagination, the machine. In terms of that machine, it's the combined work of the inventor and engineer and the skilled craftsman the assemblers, and the operators. When you observe a machine, machine such as this, there can be no doubt that it's the product of a master inventor. You never come upon a machine that is recognizable as a machine and, and think, yeah, this just happened. It grew here. It fell out of the sky. No, you... I think um, William Paley's argument about the watch, by the way, if you found a watch outside, that's a really strong argument because watches don't just happen or grow. You know they were designed, they were created, they were assembled. The Bible is like this machine in many ways, including the Old and New Testaments. The Old Testament is by itself an intricate collection of literatures with varied authors spanning 1,500 years from the beginning of the writing till the end of the writing. And yet they have both continuity and coherence, something that the Sumerian literature did not have, something which the Quran does not have. Its multiple yet complementary themes and motifs are brilliantly interwoven and brought to culmination. 
Logically, this points to a master author and editor-in-chief. When considered in these terms, Yahweh himself is the most reasonable producer of the Bible who has preserved the integrity of this masterpiece to the present day. Here are some, some sample themes that you can find in the Bible. In the next part of the outline, you can find themes on the sovereignty and the wisdom of God. Creation, beauty, and goodness. Life, happiness, blessing, and joy. Sin and death and their consequences. Redemption and reconciliation. A people for God. A holy nation. Exile and return. Restoration. Rewards and punishments. And many more. That's just some of them. And it kind of depends on how you label them and how you group them together. But there's these hundreds of themes interwoven like in a tapestry. But they all make sense. They all create the symphony, the sound of the symphony, the, the, the orchestral piece. And then you have motifs. And motifs are when themes merge, when they, when, when they come together. And then there's an image attached to those themes. And that's what we're going to really focus on. We've been exploring how biblical narratives work, and it turns out stories in the Bible are like any other story. You've got to pay attention to the characters, the setting, and the plot. Yeah, these are the basic tools an author uses to help readers see the meaning and significance of the events. Now, it's time to learn one final skill that will bring all these elements together, how to detect design patterns in biblical narrative. What do you mean by design patterns? Well, the biblical authors have shaped all these elements, character, setting, and plot, to create a series of repeated patterns that weave through story after story and tie them all together. When you notice these patterns, you'll see how different stories across the whole Bible have been coordinated to emphasize key themes. This sounds interesting, but how do you know how to find a biblical pattern? Well, biblical authors do it subtly. The best way to catch on is to watch them embed key words and images that link stories together. Take, for example, one of the main themes of the Bible, the complex and tragic human condition. Okay. So let's start at the beginning, where God is making a really good world. Right, seven times it says God saw that it was good. So those are clearly important words. Now watch. God appoints two characters named human and life to rule this world on his behalf, and they're told that everything is good for them to eat. Except for the tree of knowing good and evil. So then the humans doubt God, and in Genesis we read, they see that it's good to take this knowledge for themselves. Then we read, they desire to become wise. And then finally, they take what they want. And everything falls apart. This story is about the human condition. And on its own, it's a really powerful story, but the biblical authors don't leave it there. They turn it into a pattern. It happens again with Abraham and Sarah. God brings them into the promised land, promises them a child, but they don't trust God. They get impatient and we read the same words. They see their Egyptian slave. They take her and do what is good in their eyes. Do you get it? Yeah, the stories match. Then you get to Aaron at Mount Sinai and we read how he sees and then takes the gold of the Israelites to make the golden calf. Or there's the story about Achan who sees the gold of the Canaanites. He desires it and takes it for himself. This pattern highlights how one person's temptation can create suffering for many people. Exactly. It's just like the story of Saul, where we read that the Israelites see him. They desire him and take him as their king so they can be like all the other nations. And Saul's reign leads them to destruction. Or there's the story of David, which says that he sees Bathsheba. He desires her and then takes her and then kills her husband. And then David's family starts destroying each other. So you see, it's just one basic theme repeated over and over. These stories are all designed to show the temptation pattern. Which is kind of a downer. But the repetition builds up anticipation. Perhaps someone will come and break the pattern. This is why the stories of Jesus have been designed to carry the patterns forward to their climax. Really? Yeah. Like, what does Jesus say when he's faced with his greatest temptation to avoid dying on the cross? Uh, not my desire, but your desire be done. So the pattern flips, and you have one person resisting temptation, and his suffering provides life for many. 
Very cool. Can we do one more? Totally. How about a big one? How God brings humanity through chaotic waters into a new world. It starts on page one, where God separates these dark, chaotic waters. Yeah, dry land emerges as a home for humans to flourish. Then the pattern reappears with the chaotic waters of the flood. God rescues this remnant, Noah and his family, through the waters so that they can step onto dry land and become humanity 2.0. Now, does that basic storyline remind you of anything else? Oh, right, the famous Exodus story. Yeah, exactly. That's when God saves his chosen people from Egypt by leading them through the waters onto dry land. While Pharaoh and his army is destroyed. The pattern repeats later with Joshua and the Israelites. They pass through the waters of the Jordan into the promised land. Yeah, you got it. So now you can see how later biblical authors will project this pattern into the future. Like Isaiah, he hoped for a new Exodus with a new king leading God's people forward forward into a new creation. And in this repetition, the nations become the chaotic waters. Ah, so you can see how combining all these patterns brings us to Jesus. Yeah, notice how all the Gospels highlight that story of Jesus going to the Jordan River. He goes into the waters and back out again. His baptism. That's when God announces that Jesus is his son, who will rescue the world from the chaos of our evil and violence by going into death and out the other side. This is why baptism became such a big deal for Jesus' followers. It's about participating in this ancient pattern, going through the waters of death, following Jesus into the new creation. These design patterns seem really important. Yeah, they're actually the main way biblical authors have unified these hundreds of stories together. And every pattern develops a core theme throughout the whole biblical story that leads to Jesus. Great. That's biblical narrative, which makes up over 40% of the Bible. Now, another 30% is made up of ancient poetry. And learning to read biblical poetry is what we'll explore in the next videos. There are themes because the Bible is literature, it's Hebrew literature. And, um, and, and God most certainly superintended it. Okay? And that's what I want to talk more about. Look at Thesis 3. I, I didn't cut and paste these, by the way, just saying. I wrote those. Uh, and, you know, they, they came out of my heart and out of my mind. Um, so Thesis 3 is what is really getting closer now to the heartbeat of this part of the talk. In literature, we see motifs when multiple themes merge together into prevailing images that control less dominant ones that serve it. In the Bible, the most prevailing motif is that of the, of the Messiah. At least, it's one of the primary motifs, okay? The Messiah motif. In fact, the video I, I might have picked to replace this one um, is called The Messiah. It's just glorious. Um, and it focuses on um, how prevalent this motif is, and this character, this person, who, for all of the Old Testament, was unknown. I mean, I mean, he he was known, but unidentified. Let's say that. Okay. Right from the beginning, the Messiah figure is introduced and progressively reappears with ever more layers to his character until the full complement of his attributes is displayed. Toward the end of the Old Testament canon, we can marvel at a fully developed Messiah figure. The New Testament, of course, presents us with a man who spectacularly fit the description. And he claimed the title. And he could support his claim with a host of enviable human qualities as well as the other worldly ones. Even if we postpone an examination of the New Testament, the Messiah of the Old Testament looms large enough. Although he was a mystery, his motif became well known in Hebrew culture. When one day he would appear, he would become the savior of God's people with a full spectrum of contrasting attributes. And that's what bothers people. That's what bothers many Muslims. Jesus does have contrasting attributes. They sometimes seem like they don't go together, right? How did Jesus pray to God and yet be God? That is a paradox. Um, and how did Jesus submit to God if 
and he's the master of the universe. So there's all these other ones. And so, yeah, we ha have to get our mind around those contrasts ourselves and then help other people to get their minds around them. No disparate chain of mere human writers could have conceived of the Old Testament Messiah. That's the punch of this argument. No mere human writers could have conceived of this Old Testament Messiah and, and written him in to all the books of the Old Testament. Who lived at different times, didn't even know each other never having even read each other's material to a large extent without divine revelation, without divine revelation. So the presence of the Messiah figure in the Old Testament is the, I think, uncontestable product of divine revelation and divine authorship and divine editorializing, that is, God being the editor. And even the most gifted writers could not have inserted him so prophetically into the text without divine oversight. And so now we're going to actually dive into the texts. Okay, ready? But first, just, just take an overview. There are these that I call messianic motifs, uh, which overlap. Uh, we, could focus on, we could focus on sacrifice and offering and atonement. We could then look at number three. I'm at the bottom of, uh, of this page, under Thesis 3. We could look at the elaborate, fulfilled prophecies concerning the Messiah. But we're really not. Okay, because what I want to do is focus on the motif of the Messiah, the image of him, the figure of him, the attributes of him, the power and the glory of him. These three categories overlap again. So when we begin to go through the passages I want to go through in the next 30 minutes, you're going to see examples of uh, and references to sacrifice and atonement and suffering and um, specific prophecies. But that's not what I'm trying to really get at. I'm trying to, I'm trying to see the person of the Messiah. And now we want to focus on what I call a progressive Messianic motifs. Do you know why I call them progressive? Tell us, Scott. Because they build. Because they crescendo. Oh, I love that word. So, let's start in the beginning. Genesis 3 contains the first Messianic motif. It's just a glimpse. But it's powerful. There's this crazy story at the beginning of the Bible. We have Adam and Eve, and they're in the Garden of Eden. And everything in this garden is great. It's exactly as it should be, except there's this one tree that they're told by God not to eat from because it's dangerous and it will kill them. So that's it. Uh, avoid this fruit tree and we're fine. Right. It seems pretty simple. But in this garden, there's a snake. And it starts telling a different story. It says that if you eat of this tree, it's not going to kill you. In fact, it's going to make you become like God. And Adam and Eve, they believe the snake and they eat the fruit. And because of this, the goodness of the garden is tragically lost and evil and death enters into God's good world. Now, why is there a talking snake in the garden? I mean, this thing is a problem. Yeah, it's very strange. And even more strange is the fact that the Bible doesn't say why or how this thing even got there. It just presents the snake as this creature who's in rebellion against God and that wants to get other people to doubt God's goodness and lead them on a path towards death. And so whatever this snake is, it's the source of evil that pervades our world and our lives even still today. But there is some hope because right here in the story, God makes this really interesting promise to Adam and Eve. That someone is going to come in the future, a son of Eve. And this guy's going to come and he's going to crush the serpent's head and destroy evil at its source. However, during this battle, the serpent is going to bite this guy's heel. So it's like a mutual destruction. Yeah, it's this very strange but beautiful promise. And it's just left hanging there until the next key moment in the story. 
Genesis 3.15 says, where God is talking to Satan, because Satan had deceived Adam and Eve. He says, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat. All the days of your life I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Well, who's he? Don't you have to wonder that? Who is he? How shall he bruise the serpent's head? And how will the serpent bruise his heel? What does that mean? But it certainly conveys some kind of battle or fight. And they both take a blow. It's not just a one-way, bam, you're knocked out, you're dead. No, they both sustain an injury. You see, you have to infer those kinds of things from it. But the inference is unmistakable that it, it has to be pointing to someone who's going to have it out with the serpent. In fact, I'm not even sure by this if you know who wins. But it's going to come out. You see, we're going to te tease it out. Genesis 22 contains my next pick because that contains the story of uh, Abraham and his near human sacrifice. His near human sacrifice of his son. Christians and Muslims uh, argue about who the son was. I'm not sure it matters very much for the point of this, because there's an image to be gained here. But Muslims do have this story in their literature. And so they do celebrate what, all, what almost happened and what did happen. What, what happened? Abraham obeyed God. That's, that makes him an excellent example of, of uh, a prophet, for sure, if not a human being. Someone who obeys God, even in the most ridiculously impossible command. All right. It says, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife, they went both of them together, and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Again, it's cryptic in some ways. This would have been very cloaked at, at the time. Until later, and later, and later, when more of this comes out and builds and crescendos and develops and progresses. In Numbers 24, you have this cool prophecy from Balaam. It, it says very briefly, just, just after he failed trying to curse the Jews, he blesses them. Balaam's oracle says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Okay, again. Who? <laughs> Who? A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. The book of Numbers gets overlooked, partly because it has a really boring name. Which is a shame. In the Hebrew tradition, the book's name is Bamidbar, which means in the wilderness. And it's an epic travel log about Israel's journey through the desert on their way to the land promised to Abraham. Now this pilgrimage should only take about two weeks on foot. But instead, it takes them about 40 years. Every step of the way, God has been providing. He's been offering forgiveness. He's been giving them food and water and this crazy stuff called manna. Yeah, what is that stuff? Yeah, no, no idea. But in spite of all this, they keep complaining and they say that they wish they had died in slavery in Egypt. If I was God, I would just give up on these guys. You would think. But that's what makes this story in the final section so surprising. Israel has just arrived in Moab, and the king of Moab, he's freaked out that this huge group of people is traveling through his land. So he hires this pagan sorcerer named Balaam to pronounce curses on them. 
this guy means business. Yeah, and so Balaam, he says, okay, I'm going to pray to the Hebrew God, and let's see what happens. And three different times, he attempts to curse them, but each time he finds that he can utter only blessing. Most surprising is the last blessing, where he prophesies that out of Israel will rise a victorious king. And this king is somehow going to be connected to God's promise to Abraham to bless all nations through this family. So here's Israel rebelling down in the camp, totally unaware that up in the hills, God is protecting and even blessing them. Let's go to Deuteronomy. This has a lot of important ramifications for those who love to talk to Muslims and who sometimes have arguments. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command. Now, what do Muslims believe about this passage? They love this passage, right? They believe this is a prophecy about Muhammad. You can make that argument. You can, you can develop that argument. Were there some, you know, commonalities? Yeah, there were. Jim Walker wrote a book called Understanding Christianity and Islam in which he has a whole chapter on this subject in which he dispels the reasons, the similarities that the Muslims see and um, elevates and amplifies uh, other ones that they should see. But here's the thing. The people of the New Testament knew about this prophecy and they applied it to Jesus. And guess what? Jesus applied it to himself. In those three verses right there, in John 1.45, this is Nathaniel saying, we think he might be the one. The one prophesied. Predicted by Moses, like Moses. And then in chapter 5, this is Jesus saying, Moses wrote about me. I'm the fulfillment of that prophecy. Jesus claimed it. And then in Acts 3, this is Peter saying, yeah, that's Jesus. He's the fulfillment. He's the prophet, like Moses. The New Testament tells us. Even without the New Testament, we should be very skeptical about Muhammad being the fulfillment of that prophecy. Let's look at Job. Uh, My friend Eddie likes this one. Job 19.25 says, For I know, this is Job, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that at the last day he will stand upon the earth. What? Wait. Who is the Redeemer Job is talking about? How is he going to stand on the earth? Well, how is he related to the suffering and affliction that Job is experiencing? Seems out of nowhere. Well, it's because God dropped it down into him. Say this, Job. I don't think it needed an angel in between. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I shall see God. How do you see God in your flesh? Hello? This is referring to someone on earth, probably someone in a human form, because he stands on the earth, and Job will see him. Let's look at Isaiah, because now we're getting into the deep end, and this is so exciting, because Isaiah was, a, 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 hmm, I want to say he was the master messianic painter, but um, we're going to give the credit to God. God just really loved giving messianic prophecies to Isaiah. Maybe it was something about Isaiah, or it was the time. Okay, this, this, this special point in the progression of messianic motif going on here, because you can't shut him up. Isaiah just keeps pouring out and pouring out the content about this Messiah who just keeps becoming more and more developed. Let's go. And I'm skipping some. You know that, right? I'm not giving you every prophecy, every reference, every passage. 
Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. What? Who is this? Who could it be? Now, back then, how could they have any idea except this is the Messiah? Okay, this is the Messiah. We don't know who he is, where he's going to come, when he's going to come, exactly what he's going to do. But, wow, he's going to have some fantastically glorious qualities. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's look at Isaiah 11. I love this one, especially at Christmas time. Are you tracking with me? There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and might, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And by the way, do you know that in John chapter 5, Jesus says that all of the responsibility for judgment was delegated to him. And then in Matthew 25, Jesus is, is sitting on, on his throne, separating the sheep from the goats. He's judging the whole world. Jesus is the judge. It was delegated to him. And here it says that the Messiah would be the judge. And he shall, shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples of him, shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. And verse 12, he will raise a signal for the nations, he will assemble the banished of Israel, and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. This Messiah is getting very complex. Like when a symphony at first just playing something real simple, if you like the symphony. By the way, you should be hearing uh, tones from the Messiah. If you've ever been, uh, I mean, the piece, the, the Handel Messiah. If you've ever been to hear that, there's many examples of how something starts real quiet and real simple, and it just gets enormously more complex and sophisticated and intricate. That's what's happening here. Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossoms like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. Now, up till then, it's a little cryptic to me. You know, some messianic passages are kind of cryptic. And then the end. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Now we're talking. Now this sounds familiar. I want this Messiah. I want the one that can heal the blind and, and, and the deaf. I'm, I'm attracted to him. You know the story where the disciples of John Come to Jesus, because John's in prison, okay? John the Baptist is in prison. They come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, are you the one, or should we look for another? Are you the one? Are you the one that was promised? 
Are you, the, are you the awaited one, the expected one? I mean, you get it? They were awaiting. All the Jews were awaiting this Messiah by, by then. And they wondered, are you the one? Or is it someone else? Just tell us. So well, how did Jesus respond? He says, go and tell John. Someone could read that. That would be forceful. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lepers are cleansed. Jesus doesn't say, you know, precisely, I'm that guy. <laughs> but Jesus had a way of being understated sometimes, don't you think? He just was like that. But for the longest time I passed over that, never thought that it, that it was a, a, a fulfillment of prophecy from Isaiah 35 until I was reading a commentary just like in the fall. And I went, wow, really? How did I just never get that? Let's look at Isaiah 42. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. This is the voice of God, the Almighty God, the Father God. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He shall not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. Or bru A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. Now, doesn't that have to point to his second coming? I think. Because uh, Jesus didn't um, bring justice to... He didn't establish justice at the time that he came. There's still a whole lot of injustice in the world. Right? So this seems to me to be a long-range view forward to Jesus' second coming when he is going to do justice and execute justice as the judge and establish it. To open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. This is the kind of stuff Jesus did. Okay, That's what Jesus is known for. And if you, if you go through um, Isaiah 52 and 53 and 55 and 59, there's, there's much more of that. But look at Isaiah 61 now. And I'm going to ask somebody how Jesus claimed to fulfill this particular prophecy. I'm going to ask somebody that. Get ready. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Wait, now who is this talking? Who, who? One time I went with my daughter and her, her roommate to um, an Arabic restaurant and, and I invited a, a Muslim young lady named Thana. We had become friends at the university and she's very sweet and smart. But naturally I had to invite my, uh, so, you know, some other girls too. So the four of us were sitting there together and we were uh, going over this passage t together. And um, th this, I think, was mind-blowing to Thana. She, I think she was sitting and, and taking this in with utter astonishment that something so poignant could be in the Old Testament with, still without his name. Okay, because who is it? The Spirit of the Lord is, a, is a, it's in the first person. Do you get that? The first person. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, 
the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Amen, amen. There, th this is the first time now a passage like this has come up. Okay, so now new ground is being broken <laughs> by God who is giving the, these prophecies and, and, and by the development of this Messiah motif. It's phenomenal. Okay, so who and when and where? Okay, Jesus did it. Je how, good. This is Jesus. You, you know that. Do you know that only because of the New Testament? Maybe so. But um, you could get a very, very strong hint. Maybe even before that. Even if you lived at the time of Isaiah. But, but where does this come up in the New Testament is what I'm asking. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. What happens? I'm going to put this mic in your face, okay? Sure. Jesus went as his custom to the, uh, to the synagogue. They handed him the scroll and he started reading. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovered, uh, recovering of the sight to the blind, to set up liber liberty, them that are bruised, in verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Amen. And then he closed it and said, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Yes! Isn't that awesome? Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I thought you were going to leave that part off. I was going to fill it in, but you were, you were on, on your game there. Yes, this day, this prophecy is fulfilled in your ears. Wow! Who dares? Who dares to stand and, and make that claim? But because he could back it up by his healing the blind and healing the deaf, cleansing the lepers and the lame. He could back it up. Casting out demons, raising people from the dead. Nobody fits this pattern better than Jesus Christ of the four Gospels and the whole New Testament. 